question. For over 25 years, talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuiston is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, CF accountants and consultants adding value to clients throughout the region, the University of Texas at Dallas, creating the future. This is the second in a three-part series on healthcare. On the first segment, we looked at the history of healthcare in America. On this segment, we'll look at what's happened in healthcare in the 25 years that we've been on television. You'll see some clips from previous programs and you'll hear from these experts. Let's meet them. On my left is Dr. Don Reed. He served in leadership positions in medical societies locally and is the president elect of the 48,000 member Texas Medical Association. He specializes in colon and rectal uh, surgery and he's also a longtime member of the Rotary Club of Dallas. Don, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Sitting next to you is Britt Barrett. He recently joined the faculty of the University of Texas at Dallas as Jindal School of Management, where he actually received his PhD, so congratulations to you. Uh, he's head of a new undergraduate program in healthcare. His 30 years in healthcare included president of the Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital of Dallas, and he's the author of a book called Patients Come Second, leading change by leading the way you lead, and by the way, uh, I should say changing the way you lead, and I'm gonna find out in a minute who comes first, so um, we'll suspect what things uh, they are and we'll get you to tell us in a moment. Dr. Adam Myers became Chief Medical Officer of Texas Health Physicians Group in 2013. He's certified in family medicine, healthcare quality management, patient safety, as well as healthcare risk management. Adam, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Dennis. 25 years, the last 25 years, nothing's changed much, has it? The one constant in healthcare is change. <laughs> Tell us some of the things that, that sort of get your attention that have made life either better or worse for you and for the whole healthcare delivery system in the last 25 years. Certainly. Um, if I could take you back just a touch before the 1990s, we had uh, a great expansion of the number of people enrolled in healthcare insurance that were accessing the system. And concurrent with that, we've had significant advancement in healthcare as far as the technology and the treatments that are available to people. Those treatments and the latest advances typically are not the least expensive uh, treatment options available. So you have a combination of more people accessing care and more expensive care to be accessed. That led to a significant uptick in the overall cost curve for medicine. Uh, what we found in the 1990s, late 80s, 1990s was an effort through HMOs and other types of uh, payment organizations to, to try to bend that cost curve or control the spend a bit. Um, and that was primarily done through s simply restricting access to care, frankly. Um, some of that has been revisited now through ACOs, and I think we'll be talking about that probably later ACOs? on. ACOs? Yes, sir. Accountable Care Organizations. Thank you so much. Certainly. We appreciate that. The difference, the biggest difference I see between ACOs now and HMOs in the past is in the past, physicians were essentially paid for denying access to care. Uh, uh, they were given a per member per month allowance uh, and they, the primary care physicians were functioning as gatekeepers. Uh, and if there was money left at the end of that time period and money not spent on health care, that was money that could be shared with the physicians. Um, there you're, was you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're not going to tell me that a physician would rather have the money him or herself, are you? Well, uh, physicians are people too. Uh, but uh, the, the concern about that was that was effective as a method for bending the cost curve. But the problem was uh, there was not adequate attention to ensuring that people continued to get the treatment that they needed mm -hmm. and that the quality of the outcomes were, were following in spite of the fact that there was of uh, uh, cutting back on the cost curve. The ACOs are a little different than that. Uh, rather than just decreasing utilization, the concept is how do we increase access, uh, limit utilization to an optimal point, not just as low as you can get it, and then enhance quality such that that's optimized as well. Data really makes a big difference now. Okay, good, I appreciate that. Now, Brett, before I ask you to sort of comment on this, I'm gonna ask you what, if patients come second, okay, what comes first? 
I'm not going to tell you. No, I, it's <laughs> not. You know, I think the, the premise of the book was we have to change how we lead. And the healthcare delivery system is so sophisticated, so complex, so dynamic, that we have to change how we lead. So the premise is we have to put the team first. And we have physicians, nurses, pharmacists, biostatisticians, administrators all together. And together we need to lead differently into the future. Exceptional results require exceptional teams. And that's our thinking. All right. So this was not the way things were in 1990. Would that be fair to say? Things are significantly different. Okay. Sure. And why are they different? Why do you say this is the way it needs to go in the future? And tell us what's happened in that 25 years that changed things. Well, I think Adam's spot on. There's been a technological explosion. We're able to do more things than has ever been done in the history of mankind. I think this is the golden age of healthcare. I'm very optimistic about what's being done. Now, some of the things that we've discussed, they're complicated. They're very difficult. How do you create revenue streams that match care delivery systems? But we're curing things like have never been cured before. I think in our lifetime, uh, we're gonna cure cancer completely. We're gonna look at that mutating cell and we're gonna, we're gonna introduce pharmaceutical interventions that will make that mutating cell inert. Those are exciting times and exciting things, but the team has to work together. And so some of the challenges we see are the, the dilemma or the challenges, the friction uh, in team building. Exactly. Now, uh, Don, as the incoming uh, president-elect of the Texas Medical Association, I rather suspect that when you and your board get together and when you have your state meetings and all this, that in the last 25 years, there have been a lot of subjects that have been talked about. Give us some of those. Well, one of the most common subjects is every year that the legislature is in, se in session, and thank God our forebears had the uh, good judgment to only let the legislature meet every two years and not every year. But every time they're in session, everybody wants to be a doctor. They just don't want to go to medical school go school and do the training and so forth. Uh, but everybody wants to do what doctors do and get paid for it. They just don't want to have the, the same training. So year after year, over the years, that's been a problem with a variety of other uh, medical groups outside of medicine per se. Is it, is it funding? Is it new medical schools? Is it new uh, facilities? Is it new things, new diseases? What is all that? Well, I'm not sure how specific I should get in terms of giving examples, but uh, my chiropractor... Stay away from your own particular specialty, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, chiropractors, for example, uh, want to do a variety of things that, as doctors, we don't think that they're qualified to do. They do a lot of good things, but they want to do things in medicine that we don't think they have the training and qualification to do. My daughter plays harp in the Utah Festival Opera and we go out there to Logan, Utah every summer. There used to be this giant billboard as we drove north out of Salt Lake City advertising a chiropractor doing endocrinology. Well, chiropractors have no training in endocrinology. When I was a resident in uh, Chicago, chiropractors were advertising they could cure cancer. So there are a variety of specific things that they try to do now that we don't think they're Well, it sounds to, do. to me like you're trying to restrict competition, doesn't it? Isn't that really what you're trying to do? I mean, a lot of, you've got nurse practitioners, you've mm -hmm. got other people. I mean, does it really take someone with your vast knowledge to do everything? I mean, we've got the internet and we know that everything we see on the <laughs> internet is accurate. So that should, we should be able to self-diagnose and take it into a chiropractor and let that person help us. In an ideal world, that would be true. <laughs> However, I mean, half the people that come in and have Googled hemorrhoids on, uh, and, and come in, they don't have hemorrhoids, they have something else. So Dr. Google is not always right. Uh, but Britt is entirely correct. Healthcare is a team sport. And we used to think of the, the doctor as a captain of the ship and everybody else was an oarsman or something. Uh, and the doctor was up here on a pedestal. The real truth is that it really is a team sport. Everybody in the group, whether it's uh, nurses, physical uh, therapists, occupational therapists, respiratory therapists, all these people are part of the group and you need the whole team to provide adequate health care. Okay, and that's been that way, but just not as much as it is now. Would that be fair to say? Yes. Okay, good. Brett. Yeah, I think it's a multidisciplinary effort and practicing to the degree of their license is important. Everyone plays a role. There, there was a Dr. Welby mentality 
And because of the sophistication, we've, we've got to move away from that. Mm -hmm. And we have a convergence of new technology. We're able to do amazing things, but it's very costly. And so when you, you look at that new modality and you introduce it, you've got to figure out what the most effective methodology would be. You've, you've, got, you've got to bring a team together to do that. And I think that's one of the issues we have here in today's uh, healthcare environment. We're creating integrated delivery systems because we're bringing groups together to say how can we work more effectively. A, a good example is UT Southwestern's recent relationship with Texas Health Resources. That's a perfect example. Or Baylor, Scott and White, another great example how, how do we maximize and leverage the things that we do, do them well and collaborate together. Um, that sounds really good, um, but you've got doctors on either side of you here. Now, <laughs> you're a hospital guy. Uh, are, are they the captain of the team, or are you, you sort of the quarterback yourself? Which is it? Yeah, I'm pretty much the quarterback. That's what I yeah, thought. So I thought. Just, <laughs> we don't let them know that. A yeah. <laughs> um, couple of thoughts. The, the, the transition in the early 90s was how do we reduce cost? Now the transition is now to um, enhancing value. Value is a very simple equation of quality over cost. So you can enhance value by bending either the numerator by imp improving quality or reducing the denominator, uh, lowering cost, or a combination of the two. And the way that you do that is by trying to find the best ways to provide the right care for each patient at the right time in the most efficacious and efficient manner possible. And it really takes teams now. With many more people coming into, uh, I mean, we have 10,000 people coming onto Medicare rolls on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, and there simply are not enough uh, providers out there to provide uh, sufficient care for those people. And so with that is coming an emphasis on, as my colleagues have spoken to, top of license care. People are being pushed to operate at the top of their license. But there's a careful bridge there that you don't want to go beyond the license and exceed your competence. And so judicious team-based care is what it's about. It's a real sea change for physicians because we're used to being fairly autonomous. We're used to thinking that if it happens to our patients that we should really be calling the shots. And frankly, it's just not possible anymore and it's not optimal either. So team-based care, I believe Britt is right on the money on that one, that it's, it's the way to go. All right, now, Brent, talk to us about hospital mergers. There are some people say that, well, like you guys, we need, to, we need to have market share here. We've got to beat these insurance companies down as much as we can. Well, Medicare is going to try to continue to control costs, which is, that's an oxymoron. Uh, but are these mergers driven by the profit motive, or are they really driven by better patient care? I think they're, they're driven by the dynamics of healthcare, And you can't have multiple and duplicative systems that are so costly and pricey. It just doesn't make sense. And so it's, it, it is inspiring to see, like a Texas Health Resource, work with the UT Southwestern, a major academic center. There are things that should be done at UT Southwestern that shouldn't be done in a smaller hospital. But you create a hub spoke, and some people don't like that. There are fiefdoms, and we've got to get, a, get through, past that. And to your point about do we work together, we got to. And the insurers, the fiscal intermediaries, they play an important role in that. They are merging as well. Well, that's Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Signal, the rest. They have got to create economies of scale through their IT platform, to Adam's point, so that we can move a person through the patient, the, through that continuum of care as efficiently as possible. Use good data to determine what the most efficacious process is for them. So when they, when they come in with Dr. Google to get a hemorrhoidectomy, we have plenty of information to say, this is the best treatment plan, and it's vetted throughout our entire organization. Let's move forward. Adam? Just this morning, I attended a ribbon cutting ceremony at uh, Texas Health Resources. We opened a clinic in Burleson that is an APRN clinic, Advanced Practice Registered Nurse. There's not a doctor in that office, okay? And so this is in a community where there are more Medicare lives needing to be seen than there are providers willing to see them. We saw that need, we heard it, we've designed a system of access there with clinical support from physicians nearby and ongoing dialogue, but we just opened that today and it's gonna take thinking differently about the provision of care to get people taken care of. All right, Don, I was in uh, DC in 2009 uh, with a group that I belonged to and we were being briefed by one of the key uh, architects of what became the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. 
And that uh, bureaucrat was kind enough to tell us that they were going to increase access, increase the quality of care, and cut the cost by using a great government program. Uh, is that what's happened? <clears throat> well, I think that fits the, uh, the information that we received from a uh, doctor who came over in probably about 1980 and talked to us at Medical City about the British healthcare system. He made the observation that if you make any service, whether it's medicine or cars or laundry or whatever, if you make any service totally free to the public, the demand for it will always exceed the ability of the country to pay for it. And I think we have a, a good example of that. We I would do. say on, in terms of hospital mergers, I think hospital mergers are a, a reaction to the Affordable Care Act because hospitals are the ones that have enough capital to be able to put together these uh, Affordable Care Acts. All right. I'm going to show you a video clip that we, uh, we taped, I don't know, about two years ago. Scott Flannery with United Healthcare was on here uh, talking about Obamacare. So it's video clip number six. When you're ready, let's run that clip. I made the comment that I, I've never been in more meetings planning for scenarios that may not happen um, than I have in the past two years, um, or may happen, who, who knows. But I, I think when you think about the implementation, so a lot of things have already been implemented um, and, and put in that were part of the 2012, and, and then obviously things coming up for 2013. Um, 2014 has some, some additional nuances. Um, for example, the insurance, uh, the insurance company fee, um, which is not to be called a tax, but it is a fee that's passed on to employers, both fully insured and self-funded. Uh, that's estimated to be anywhere between 2 and 3 percent. So when you start thinking about some of those things that are right down the road, um, it's, hard not, it's hard to find something that doesn't add to the cost of the, of the whole programs or the whole system uh, when you look at what's down the road 2014, 2015 and beyond. Okay, so what we were talking about, particularly employers and employees, is what the cost is going to be. The uncertainty, Don, is one of the things that just kills uh, insurance companies in that particular case. Uh, what does that do to you guys? It, it, has the Affordable Care Act been good or bad or a little of this, a little of that? Uh, how do you see it? Well, nothing is either all good or all bad. The Affordable Care Act gives us the promise of being able to do medicine as a team sport to include all the things that should be done that haven't been reimbursed by insurance in the past. So as in Fort Worth, you know, the EMTs go out to the frequent flyers that they bring into the hospital all the time. They go out and see them on a regular basis and make sure they're taking their medicine so they don't have to haul them to the hospital all the time. There are a lot of little things like that that make a big difference in the total cost of care that we haven't been reinforced, reimbursed for uh, by insurance in the past. So there's an opportunity for great change in that system. Well, I, that's good. Now, I want to look at a graphic, and actually a video a clip number eight, as Stan Hupfield, who ran the Integra system in Oklahoma City till he retired. Let's see what Stan had to say. Well, the, the problem that hospitals have is they're trying to operate in two worlds. They, they've got one foot in one bucket, and that's the fee for service. And they're still making money the old-fashioned way, and that's by is number of patients in beds and max, maximize service to those patients. While they prepare for the new millennium, which says the way to, to uh, do well in healthcare is to keep people healthy, keep them out of the hospital. Now, in order to survive in that kind of environment, these guys are going to have to have bigger market shares. So the, the, the next big battle among hospitals is who has the most market share? Because that's, that's going to be the defining moment. If you're, if you're going to give up re revenue streams in your hospitals, you've got to have a lot of patient income to make up for that. Britt, is he on target there or not? I think to a certain extent he's, he's right. Uh, you know, the Affordable Health Care Act is a rewrite of this relationship or this commitment. We are now saying health care is a right and everyone's entitled to that right. And so we're scrambling to fill every element. Previously, an individual had to navigate it on their own. They had to determine where they were going to get their services with a little prodding and poking by practitioners, but it was their, their, uh, their privilege. Here, we're providing everything to everyone. That is, as, as Don mentioned, that's, that can become a bankrupt proposition, and we've got to figure out how to do it. So you're seeing systems come together. You know, there was a lot of confusion back in 2009. We didn't know what the heck was going to happen. We were terrified. We were, we were in the fetal position in, under our desks crying for, for help, and it was a scary time. It was the most dramatic change in health care policy in the history of our country. Fast forward five years, I'm of the opinion it's done exceptionally well. There are elements that are uh, invaluable. And moving forward, we're going to continue to trim that sale, those sales and move us forward to look at the whole continuum of care 
for an individual. Okay, now I don't want to get involved in that because between your socks and my tie, we're pretty well uh, blowing this thing away. But the idea of, of, of health care being a right, you really think that's true? That's what we've said. Now, that, I didn't ask you if that's what we said. I asked you if you think that's the way it should be. Is that, in fact, the way it should be? I realize that people have said that. In my, my personal opinion, if you dictate that it is right, then you have to make important, purposeful if, societal decisions if that we will, you were unwilling that, to make. Who's the you? If you dictate that, you said. Well, with policy you weren't talking about me. Policymakers said the voters have you're spoken. About, you're talking about government? Yeah. You're talking about the voters. Okay. That'd be a whole program right there. That'd be because awesome. if that is a right, then someone has to pay for that right. So you're effectively causing someone else to be put upon because that's a right. Last I heard, it was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I don't think there are any more rights, but that's another issue. Let's look at what Stan Hupfield had to say about hospitals. Rich, you'll love this. Go ahead and run <laughs> clip 10. The patient accounting function, the billing function within a hospital system is very time consuming and extremely expensive and a lot of administrative costs associated with it. Some people would even go so far as to say that, that doctors and hospitals end up with the customer of theirs being the insurance company or Medicare as opposed to the patient. Is there any truth to that allegation? Well, I think you have to look at hospitals, obviously, from a clinical point of view. First and foremost, they're there for the patient. But there's no question, when you have someone else paying the bill, and you have a guarantor other than the patient, they're also your customer, and you have to work with them. You have to meet their requirements. Let's be candid. Hospitals have, on average, 50 to 60% of their book of business from Medicare and Medicaid. They're a governmental contractor. As a result, they have to make sure that they bill, that they collect, and that they follow those administrative rules and regulations. Well, Stan, and you spent your, your life in this. And so, so tell me how you deal with this uh, seems to be a dilemma to me. The dilemma is that, number one, you want to do what's right for the patient. You want to do what's right for the shareholder if it's a for-profit hospital. Or if it's a not-for-profit hospital, you want to do what's right because of the way you're taking care of people. Uh, how do you offset that with knowing that your biggest paychecks are coming from the government. I mean, how do you stand up and say, let's change this? You know, every day when I was an active hospital executive, I thought I was answering the essential question, and that is how do we deliver care to the most people at high levels of quality and constrain cost? The truth is I was not. The, the truth is I was acting in the best interest of my own organization. The truth is I was trying to outcompete my competitors. The truth is I was trying to establish a strong bottom line and enhance my own reimbursement. That's the truth. That, and that's how I operated. It's only when I got out of that could I see that here, here are these marvelous institutions, these technological giants in hospitals that, that in many cases are establishing programs and, and building enterprises based on ego and based what's on best needs of, of their institution as opposed to what's in the best interest of the community and how to drive costs down. And by the way, Adam, his book was called Political Malpractice. And I, I suggest that for that re, uh, the viewer to watch and read that book because um, uh, he really blows that away. So uh, we just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, give me some thoughts about uh, something else that you see up to right now that we ought to be thinking about as a patient or somebody's in the business. Uh, I think one of the things that we could really work to emphasize, and we've described up to this point, that with increased specialization within healthcare over the last 25 years, uh, comes increased fragmentation. And w we have to counter that. There needs to be better communication, and the teamwork on the team is crucial for that, and we've described that a couple of times, but creating a team with your patients is, is, in, is uh, critical moving forward. Uh, each one of our patients perceives that their needs and we have if we take the aggregate of all of the folks who are patients in our healthcare system we have infinite perceived needs but we have very finite resources and that disconnect represents a challenge for us and how do we meet that how do we do so in a way that still brings the human touch to medicine and helps people get and stay well is what we really need to face moving forward. Brit? I'd add to that. I think the individual needs to be aware of his or her 
personal behaviors and the impact that has on their health and wellness. And we need to move to the, in that direction. Individuals need to own it. And with clinicians' assistance, cure and, and, and deal with uh, illness, but an individual responsibility can never be understated. That's a good point. Don, you have the last word. I totally agree with that. And I would just say that practicing medicine is still fun. It's still exciting. Things to come will be even more exciting. And I think things will continue to get better for patients despite all the problems and hassles we have with the government and bureaucracy. Well, I am delighted to hear that because the stories we hear are doctors who are quitting because of all the paperwork and I hear doctors spend 20 minutes on the phone with the insurance company and then they go Medicare trying to figure out whatever an IM10, IMC10, is that the na next IC, thing? ICD10. IC, yeah, ICM10, it's like intercontinental, blue, intercontinental ballistic missile <laughs> aimed at the taxpayer, that's the only thing I can remember. Anyway, we'll talk about it in the next program. Thank all of you for what you do. You know, as you've heard, the last 25 years have been interesting <laughs> and by the way, exciting to say the least. And we hope you'll join us on McQuistion TV for the future of healthcare, as well as the program on the history of healthcare. Now, I know that this issue is personal to many of you, so thanks again for inviting us in to talk about things that matter with people who care. The DVD of this program is available for $20, plus $5 postage and handling, and in Texas, applicable tax. For more information, call 214-750-5157 or email nikkien at nikkimcquistion.com. Visit our website at www.mcquistiontv.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at www.twitter.com slash mcquistiontv or download McQuistion TV video podcasts on iTunes. of McQuistion is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, CF accountants and consultants, adding value to clients throughout the region, the University of Texas at Dallas, creating the future. Thank you for joining us in our 25th year of Conversations That Matter. <laughs>